One of the things I know, or I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but they say if your arm tingles, it could be a warning sign of something else. Some people say if your arm tingles, your jaw hurts, and you have pain in your chest, you could be having a heart attack. Or maybe even a stroke. See, warning signs are all over the place. I mean, how many of you read warning signs? Maybe on medicine, there are warning signs, aren't there? Because guess what? On, warning, on medicine, there's side effects, aren't there? And, you know, we read warning signs, but a lot of times it just goes right through our, our one ear and out the other, so to speak. Because warning signs are things that we don't like to hear about. We don't like to hear about, oh, that you got it wrong. And one of the worst things that students do, because, you know, students are going back to school tomorrow, right? And so tomorrow they're going to go back to school and they're going to hear a warning by the teacher to study, to get ready. Tests are coming. You know, I used to hate tests. But then I realized that the test is just an opportunity not to listen to the teacher. Just to take the test. So I, I, I tried to could have put a good spin on that. But there was a warning that something was going to happen. There's always warnings in our lives. We have warnings about a lot of different things. Warnings about... Um, uh, your, your car can give you warnings. You know, those lights on your dashboard? What do they call those lights when they light up? Someone said warning lights. Someone said idiot lights. Um... <laughs> Because when they light up, you've already had the problem, right? There, there are warnings all over in life. And, and, and I think Jude here is trying to warn us. Jude is a friend of, of Peter's. He's writing and dependent upon Peter here. And he's trying to warn us about some things that are going on within the midst of the church. And one of the things that, are, that is a big problem in the midst of the church that he's involved with is this issue of what I would call cheap grace. Cheap grace. You see, cheap grace is basically uh, grace that says, I'm going to get my ticket punch and then I'm not going to worry about what God says or what God does at all. I just know I want to go to heaven. I just want to get in. I don't care about following God. I don't care about listening to God. I don't care about doing what God says. I don't care about serving God. I don't care about worshiping God. Now, what kind of person would that be? In fact, I would challenge someone, why would you want to go to heaven if you didn't want to worship God now? You know what you're going to be doing in heaven? You know what we're all going to be doing? We're going to, we're going to be worshiping God, aren't we? And that should be the thrill of our lives. It should be the joy of our lives. You see, Jude here is wanting people to realize that grace changes lives. And if you have cheap grace, you won't make it to first base in the Christian life. You're not going to make it because you're going to have trouble. And the trouble in the church was because certain people had come in saying, hey, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. In other words, you don't have to follow Jesus. You don't have to. It's just here's the easier way. You see, that's what is going on here in the book of Jude. You see, people want a God, but they want a God without obligations. Do you get that? They want God, but they don't want God to tell them what to do. Remember when you were a kid and your parents told you what to do? Did you like that? Not most of us didn't. Most kids don't like when the, when the dad or the mom says, do this or else. We kind of, we kind of, our back gets kind of um, gnarly or whatever. I, the, 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 the pines in our back go up and we go, I don't want to do it. We just naturally want that. We want Christianity without commitment. We want the easy way. And the fastest growing group in America are those who call themselves spiritual but, but are not affiliated with any church and don't want to be. They're called what we call the nuns today. In fact, if you add the population in the United States from atheism and nuns, that makes 38% of America are nuns today, meaning they have none, no real stable faith. Or they don't believe in God at all. They have a faith, but they don't believe in God. They don't believe that God is going to stipulate certain things to their lives. They want a spirituality without commitment. They want a salad bar kind of religion. They want to create their own. 
And so Jude here tells us, what is this all about? Why is, why is cheap grace such a concern? Why is it such a concern? Well, one thing he goes on and he tells us about some things. He, he gives illustrations. Jude says, I'm getting to tell you what you already know. You already know this. He's introducing the whole topic by saying, now I want you to remind you, remind you, in other words, you already know this, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved, and then he goes on and gives some examples of what they already know. In other words, you know, uh, let, me, let me stop here. One of the things that we have to understand, that the reason we study the Bible over and over again is not always to find something new in the Bible. It's to remind us what? What we already know to do. But you know what? We are weak sometimes to be able to do it. We're not that strong sometimes. We need to hear over and over again the admonishment of the Lord, don't we? We need to hear over and over again, the Lord says. The Lord says. We need to hear that. Because you know what? Our world is fighting against us. The world does not want a Christian who says this is right and that is wrong. They want to make up their own religion. They want to say that, you know, we, we were talking about it in class today. We were saying that, you know, the world wants an easy salad bar religion. Choose what you want. Pick what you want and then leave. But when Christians come around and say, listen, this is right, that's wrong. They say, wait a minute, we're tolerant. We're just not tolerant of that. <laughs> You see? People want to be tolerant. Oh, we're tolerant of everything. We're tolerant of, of, of this religion, and we're tolerant of that religion. We're tolerant of this belief. We're tolerant of that belief. But they're intolerant, you know what, of truth. They're intolerant that something can be true for everybody. But that's what the Bible is. If Christianity doesn't claim that there's something true for everybody, we might as well pack up and go home. But Christianity is what we call true truth. It means that there is something that is right, not only for me, but for you and for every single person in the world, whether they're living in America or Africa or South America or North America, wherever they are, at any time and any place, there are things that are always going to be true true. You see, that's what Jude is saying here. Cheap Grace says, no, 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 I, I want to be able to just get my ticket punched. I want to be in the heavenly glories. But you know what? Cheap Grace didn't get you there. Cheap Grace only gets you into trouble. Cheap Grace doesn't even get you to first base. You know, I've been watching Little League Baseball. You know, they're on TV. And I, I love watching Little League Baseball. Um, I want to, uh, we, we just... It's just a lot of fun. Don't, don't you think it is? It's just a lot of fun to watch kids get so excited playing a game that I love to play. I played all my life. It was just a lot of fun to hit a little bitty ball with a round bat and, and watch people go crazy uh, trying to get the ball and throw you out. But it's a lot of fun. And some of them do really good. And he says this, but he says something here. He says, listen, cheap grace is only going to get you into trouble. And the first trouble it's going to get you in is unbelief or a lack of commitment to God's promises. Look what he says. He says, listen, you know this, that Jesus who saved the people out of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. In other words, what was the problem in Egypt? You know, what, what did they do? What did they want to do when they left Egypt? They wanted to go back where? They wanted to go back to Egypt, didn't they? They said, hey, wait a minute. You saved us, and now my life is harder than I had it easier in Egypt, so I want to go back to captivity. That was basic unbelief. There was no commitment of their faith. They wanted a salad bar religion, and they only wanted religion that would benefit them all the time. So when they, were, when they were in the wilderness, they said, no, we don't want that. We want to go back. And you know what God did to them? He destroyed everyone over 20 years old. They did not enter the promised land. Then he goes on and says, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains and in gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. This refers back to Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. When the sons of God married or had relations, sexual relations with the sons of men. And he's going back here and Jude has that in mind. He's saying this is wrong, that the angels should have not 
not done that. The angels left their proper abode in heaven because when angels come to earth, they come to earth as appearance of men, appearance of people. And they had this relationship they had. It says in chapter six, chapter 6 in Genesis, and here Jude is looking at that. He's looking back to the Old Testament because each of these are Old Testament things. Egypt, the angels. And then he goes back to Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities verse 7, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. I want you to notice a few things. Three illustrations of, of unbelief. Three illustrations of faith without commitment. Three illustrations of what I would call cheap grace. The Egypt, the, the, the Israelites, when they left the land of Egypt, wanting to go back. The angels who left their proper abode did not submit to God, but wanted to have relations with the sons of man on earth. And then Sodom and Gomorrah, where we find the sin of homosexuality so prevalent in that passage. And so you have these sins that are right there in front of us. And it's saying, you know what, God said this is the standard. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what people says. This is the standard. We submit as believers by the grace of God to God. We don't get to make up our own religion. You know, if, 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 if we were left to make up our own religion, you know what would happen? We would, we would make a God that we can control. See, if you make up your own religion, guess what? None of the problems or none of the sins or none of the issues in your life would be sinful, would they? You'd always think, well, I don't have a problem with that, so that must be wrong. See, that's the problem with human beings. When we try to make up our own things, we confine God to a box. We confine God to something that he's not. And he's saying, if you're going to have faith, believers, if you're going to have faith, it cannot be based upon cheap grace that just says, I'm going to get my ticket punch, go to heaven, but I'm going to live the way I want to. I'm not going to have to worry about how I live at all. He said, don't you remember what I did? God's saying the people who had unbelief, who did not believe me when they were in the wilderness, they died in the wilderness. Don't you realize the angels who, who left their proper abode of heaven and came down to earth to have relations with the sons of men? Don't you realize I have put them in chains? Don't you realize that Sodom and Gomorrah I have destroyed because of their sinful behavior of homosexuality against men on men who were also angels at the time? You see, he's saying that the punishment for that is not just five years, ten years, but look what it says. It is the punishment of what? Eternal fire. Now, I guarantee you, if you go to a restaurant and start talking about eternal fire and hell or go to a party and talk about this, guess what? Everybody's going to leave your presence. It's not a fun thing to talk about. People don't go, oh, oh, good, we get to talk about hell today. <laughs> go to work saying, hey, what do you think about hell? And people go, uh, mm. they don't want to talk about hell. They don't want to talk about judgment. See, if we created our own religion of cheap grace, there would be no judgment, would there? And you know what? The problem is if there is no judgment and if there is no hell, then what are we being saved from? Why do we as believers bank our life on Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross? Why would Jesus need to go to the cross, die in our place, and rise again from the dead, go to heaven, and is coming back again? Why would he need to do that if there is no final judgment, an eternal judgment that it is said here? You'll see in verse 13, it also says that the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved for ever and ever and ever. The Bible says at the end of life, men is are appointed to die and then come the judgment. We cannot escape judgment if we believe in Christianity. We cannot escape judgment if we believe in God. We cannot escape God's justice if we believe in God's grace. In fact, grace means nothing if we're not saved from anything. 
If we're not saved from our sin. If we're not saved from God's justice. And look what he does, says also. He says the unbelief. Then he talks about the pride. He goes on and says in verse 8. Yet in like manner these people also relying on their dreams. In other words they're having these dreams. They believe are super spiritual. They're having these dreams and they're coming to people and telling them they defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme glorious ones. In other words, they're blaspheming. They, they credit to God what is not God's abode. They, they, they reject all authority in their life. They're saying, I don't have to do that. I don't, you know what? One of the greatest, relig the religion of the day says, you know what? Do what you want. That's what the religion today, isn't it? More and more, our society in America is saying, do what you want. Do what you want. Do what you want. Do what you want. And when someone comes along and says, you know what, you can't do what you want. There is something that is right. There's something that is wrong. There's something that is true. There's something that is good. How can you have good and evil, good and bad, if there's not anything right and wrong in our lives? And Jew says this, look at it, it's like the, the, like the Michael, the archangel. Here's a positive example of how to deal with evil. He says this, but the archangel Michael contended with the devil, disputing about the body of Moses... And he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But the, these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they're destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. See, what he's saying here is this. He's saying there, cheap grace not only produces unbelief, it produces rebellion. It produces uh, um, anarchy. It produces the idea that all the power is mine. Depend on myself. You know, that's what, that's what the world is saying. Do what you want and depend on yourself. You know what? That's contrary to Christianity. We do what God wants and who do we depend on to do that? God. His Holy Spirit. We should never be afraid of the Spirit of God working in our life because we are dependent on the Spirit of God to obey God. We are dependent on God. And now, Michael the Archangel, this, this is funny, I, I saw on TV one time, and, and it, it, this is colored the, the way I, I view exorcism. You know what exorcism is? It's, a, it's, it's this idea that has come down through the centuries where people would cast out devils and demons from inside someone's body. And we see this, Jesus doing this in, in the book of, in the Gospels many times, the book, when he talked to Legion, and there were many of them, and he cast them out, and you remember where they went? They went into, they said, don't, 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 they, they went into the pigs, and the pigs went over over and everybody was upset because the pigs were part of the, the economy and the economy went bad and everybody was upset and, and it went on and on and on. But you know what? The angel, Michael, the archangel, did not assume that they were dependent on, you know a lot of people say, I, I saw this on TV. You can, get, you can get in trouble watching TV. Okay, let me just say that. There was a preacher on TV. And this preacher was casting out devils from this person. And he recounts the story of, of he was telling the story of it actually. And he recounts the story saying, all of a sudden as I was doing this, all the furniture in the room started floating. And all the, the temperature of the room got ice cold because all the furniture was getting icy. I don't know how it floats and get icy. And he said, you know what? We cast out the demon. The furniture went back down to earth. The temperature got well. And I said to the devil, you know, you better come back here because I'm, gonna, I'm not through with you yet. <laughs> and you know what that is? That's pride. The Michael the Archangel. See, I believe that the gospel is sufficient to rescue people even from the devil. The gospel is sufficient. It is the power of God unto salvation because what happens when the gospel is preached, when we hear the good news that Jesus actually died for sinners and that by receiving Christ, guess what? The Holy Spirit comes into your life, cleans your life. You can't clean your life up before, you, before that, can you? Do you have the power to clean your life up? Is the gospel message clean your life up and come to Jesus? Is that the gospel message? Someone say no. That's not the gospel message. 
What's the gospel message? Come, all you are heavy laden and are burdened, and I will give you rest for your souls. For what? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Cheap grace doesn't do that. See, cheap grace doesn't do that. It depends on self. You say, I want to go to heaven, but I'm going to depend on myself. I'm going to do what I want to do. Even the devil. See, we have to be careful about that. I've known some people who have been demonized. But I never, never did that. I believe the issue with them was that the gospel needed to be constantly preached over and over again, telling them that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. And he died for sinners like you and me. And if you receive him, the Spirit will come into your life and, and, and baptize you and, and give you power like you've never believed before over sin and over rebellion in your own life. You see, chief grace doesn't get you to first base. It just gets you into a bunch of trouble. He goes on and gives some more examples. He gives them woes. He gives them woes. And this is the attitude. He says, woe to them in verse 11. For they walk in the way of Cain. You know what Cain did? Do you remember what Cain did? He was the first what? Murderer, right? He did what he wanted to do. He didn't do it God's way. He didn't obey God's law. And then it says, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir. What was Balaam's heir? He thought he could what? Buy God's power, right? He thought he could buy his way into heaven. He thought he could buy a relationship with God. He thought he could buy it and purchase it. And it says, and perished in Korah's rebellion. What was Korah's rebellion? You go back to Genesis chapter 19. You see Korah's rebellion that he was just disobedient to Moses, who was the prophet that God had established. And so here is, here is the issue of bad character. Here is the issue of rebellion or the wrong attitude and the wrong belief. All of this is going on, he says, inside the church because there is a warning label. There is a warning. You know, when someone comes into your house and steals something in your house, how do you feel? Betrayed. Betrayed violated. Angry, right? You want to get them back, don't you? You want, you want it, you want, in fact, many times we want to take vengeance. Vengeance. And what does the Lord say? Vengeance is mine. God is going to judge. There is a judgment side to Christianity that we have to realize. The gospel is good news. The gospel is great news. Because if you realize it, if you're living your life apart from God, God is going to judge you for the sins that you commit in this life. He's going to do that. He's going to do that because of your unbelief. He's going to do that because you have not kept uh, your, the authority of God's word. He's going to constantly do that. He's going to do it because you have violated his word. See, God's word does not change. People say, well, how, why do you read a book that's 2,000 years old in some places and 4,000 years old in other places? And it has history of about 6,000 years in it. Why believe in a book like that? You know why? Because God says it's true. God says it's true. God says there is right, there is wrong, there is truth, there is error, and it affects the way we live. It affects all of that. He says, when you hear people talking about cheap grace, when you hear people saying, oh, just get your ticket punched, come when you want to, do when you want to, don't, don't worry about all the commands, all the stipulations, because we want to believe that Christianity is just about love. I'm going to say Christianity is about love. But not the way the world makes it to be. If you love somebody, you don't give up on them, do you? You know, if you love somebody, sometimes there's a command in the Bible that says this is right. You don't leave them. You, you work with them. You, 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 you help them as much as you can uh, by the power of God. You do what you can. 
And he says this, these people are not going to be around. Look, look, what the, look what he says about them. He says, they're, they're clouds without water. Now, what's a cloud without water? Nothing. Right? Think about a cloud. A cloud is made of water. They look full. They're like, the, they're, like they're, bringing, they're bringing in need of rain. They're bringing rain, but they never rain. They don't produce. See, if, see, if we just believe that grace just gets us into heaven, but grace doesn't change our lives, that we've missed out on the greatness of Christianity. We want changed lives. We want our lives to be changed. They're like, you know, these, these, these false teachers in this book are, are like trees without fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is not in their lives. They're like raging waves of the sea. It says, even, ever been to the seashore after a good tornado? Or, excuse me, tornado. Well, tornado. A good hurricane. And all the junk from the bottom of the sea has foamed up and has been thrown by the waves on the beach. It's pretty ugly looking, isn't it? Pretty ugly looking. What's on the bottom, bottom of the sea? And all their filth and all the things. That, these people are actually filthy. And then the wandering stars. They blaze with a light like a shooting star. But they don't have anywhere to go. See, if you want a place to go, if you want a life to live, if you want a purpose to follow, you can't have religion or spirituality apart from what's true. He said back in verse 3, Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write an, an appeal to you or write appealing to you to contend Contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. And part of our faith is that God is a just God. God doesn't look over sin. God doesn't look over sin, but you know what he does? Instead of looking over it, he died for it. Instead of looking over sin and sweeping it under the carpet and saying, it'll be okay, you know what he did? He rose again from the dead to justify us before God. You know what he's going to do with sin? Eventually he's going to come back and judge sin and, and the sheep and the goats will be separated, the wheat and the tares will be separated. This is what God does. This is who the God we worship. This is the God who's just, who's right, who's good, who's, who's victorious. This is the God that we will worship forever and ever and ever and ever. Because he has given his grace so that we don't have to pay and fall under his justice. You know what? One of the things I realize and one of the things I have to do better I think that contending for the faith and these examples, even in verses 14 and on, we read about Enoch and we read about all these different things. One of the things we have to realize is that even our children look at how we live. We, they look at how we live. What happens when we have a tragedy? What happens when we have difficulty? What happens when things don't go our way? What happens when we're persecuted? What happens when people reject us? What happens? What happens? What happens? It should make us to run more and more to Jesus. It should make us more and more try to figure out what happened at that cross. What did Jesus accomplish at that cross? He accomplished everything that we need to live in this life. He accomplished everything that we need to have grace in this life. If you need grace today, listen, there, there's, you can't have spirituality without Christianity. You can't have spirituality without believing in Jesus. You can't have spirituality without following Jesus. You can't have spirituality without wanting to do what God wants you to do. It's not get, just getting your ticket punch, not becoming religious, not showing up to church. It is a life of commitment and love for the Lord Jesus himself.
One of the hardest things I think for us to talk about with our friends and family is that God is just. That there is a hell. But someday God will make everything right in this world. And we should plead with people. One person said that if, if Christianity is true and God is just and hell is real and it lasts for all eternity and the world was full of, full of um, uh, broken glass, he would be glad to walk on the broken glass to tell people that the, the urgency to repent and to believe in Jesus Christ because everybody needs to understand that God's grace is powerful to change their life. Cheap grace doesn't get you there. It only gets you in to trouble. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you today that Father, we don't have just cheap grace. We don't have things that break down in our spirit because God's grace is powerful. It will change us if we let it. It will change us even over time when we, when we even resist it. It will overcome the, the hurts and the habits and the hang-ups of our lives. I believe that the grace of God can change anyone. Because there's nothing more powerful than the grace of God. And if you are here today and you have been touched and realized that you need the grace of God. And you have in your heart of hearts been moved to confess Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior. And, and, and to receive God's grace into your life. I ask you this day. I want you to come forward as we sing a song of commitment. I want you to come forward and say, I want to be baptized. I want to, I want to declare to this world and to my people and to my friends and family that I belong to Jesus. Some of you need to place a commitment to a church home. The Bible says that, that church attendance, church commitment is not an option. There's no unchurched or lone ranger believers in the Bible and so we open the doors of our church to receive you to welcome you Father I pray for all of us here whatever commitment we are making today, whatever decision we are making in the heart of hearts today, I pray that Father your grace would cause change in our lives change because you are just but you are gracious and we should never presume the grace is cheap. It's costly. It cost Jesus his life. Father, we pray that you would change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand today and sing. Pure in heart, O God. In 492, if God is so moved in your life, I welcome you forward. If you need to talk to someone today about